name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So today is Trinity Sunday, the only Sunday of the church year dedicated to a doctrine, and uh, preachers through the centuries have muddled through trying to explain the Trinity. I tell you this to lower the expectations of my attempt to explain the Trinity. Uh, people have used images like an apple with the skin and the, uh, the flesh and the core all being apple but having you know, very different appearances or water being water and ice and steam but all still having the same property. Uh, some priests have stood up and said my role as parent, my role as pastor, my role as spouse are all different but I am one. But none fail to really grasp the fullness of what it means to understand God as Trinity. And for some reasons, it seems like we may have just made this unnecessarily complicated. There is a God who loves us. Uh, why do we have to have a formula that seems uh, like in a complicated mathematical equation, three and one of the same substance? But I think it is important. It's important because I think it affirms to us three unique things about God. And I'll talk about them, but I want you to remember these three unique things about God that the Trinity celebrates. That God is relentless. That God has been after us. That God has wanted to show us God's love since the beginning of time. And the Trinity is about the only way that we can articulate a God who has reached out in creation, who has reached out in the full revelation and outpouring and emptying of God's self, and the God that will never let us go. So one, the relentlessness of God. Two, that we understand God in relationship, that God is in relationship with God's self, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is in relationship with us, and we most fully understand and connect with God when we're in relationship with God and one another. And three, the God who was there at the beginning of time, who made all things, the God who broke into history and became flesh, the God who promises to never let us go, is our assurance, our hope, that no matter what life throws at us, no matter what happens in this life, that we will never be apart from God. So the Trinity is our sign of hope. It is our assurance that God is relentless and always moving towards us. It is our confidence that when we're in relationship with one another, that we connect most fully with God, and it is our hope that we will never, ever be apart from God, and no matter where our life is, that hope is our song. So let me tell you a little bit about my trip and where, again, uh, it's going to be a weekly theme, uh, let me tell you where I connected with this truth, uh, and it's kind of connected when I was talking to the third grade class, uh, and one of them asked me what the holiest place uh, on my trip was, where was the place that was the holiest? And I thought about this one moment uh, as I went through all these places expecting to feel some absolute definitive presence. And intellectually it was fascinating, culturally it was absolutely everything I expected, but there were few places where I felt like I was uh, so near to God. Uh, but there was one, and a picture came out of it that I, uh, I'm gonna share with you, uh, but it was a moment where I, was put face to face with the truth that God meant for us to be the holiest places in the world. And that each one of us are God's temple. And when we relate to one another, we are most fully the body of Christ, the church, no matter how grand and opulent uh, or significant a historical site it is, God is no more present in any of those places than in our own hearts and when we care for one another than in our community of faith. So this is the picture. Uh, this is from uh, about halfway up or down the Mount of Olives. Uh, and one of the things that's supposedly one of the most significant uh, moments in the church year there in Jerusalem is on Palm Sunday. And they start up near Bethany. Remember, Bethany is where uh, Lazarus was raised and where uh, Mary, uh, extravagantly anoints Jesus with nard before he heads to, to Jerusalem. Uh, and right next to that is Bethpage. And Bethpage is where uh, he sends his disciples ahead to go and, and, and get the colt. 
uh, and then they follow that all the way down the Mount of Olives. Uh, and this is a church, uh, uh, the church Dominum Flevit, which means uh, God weeps, or our Lord, our Master weeps. And this is a place that they stopped in Luke's Gospel, halfway down, and I'll leave this up here, uh, uh, and I'll bring or refer to it again. And about halfway down, Jesus is looking over the temple. Remember, the temple has been a complicated place in Jesus' story. Uh, depending on which version, uh, he's heading there and will turn the money tables over, or he's already done so. Uh, but the temple is where God resides. Remember, Jesus is telling us about a relentless God, a God that is always seeking us out. And his relationship with the temple was a place when he was first presented as a child. His family didn't have uh, the proper uh, the money to be able to get the proper sacrifice. It's a place uh, that uh, the people have to pilgrimage to and then exchange money to, in order to get in to, the, to be near God. Uh, and it seems so incongruous with the way that Jesus talks about a relentless God that is always seeking us out. Uh, but he's looking over the temple, and his disciples are absolutely awestruck. This temple has stones, and some of the base stones are still existing, about as large as that pew. I mean, stones, you can't even imagine how they'd be able to, to lift them one on top of the other uh, about, uh, about this high and, and equally as wide and about almost as long as that pew. Just the individual stones, uh, and they're gold. Uh, some of the fronting is gold-plated. There's huge, huge brass doors and the disciples are just absolutely awestruck. This must be God's house. This must be where God is so fully present. And Jesus weeps for Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem that kills its prophets. Jerusalem, Jerusalem that, uh, that keeps people at bay, that can't find peace. And he says there will be a day where that temple will be tossed over, stone upon stone, pulled apart, and the temple of God will be in ruins. I think he's talking about the relentlessness of God, that God can't be contained, that God always has been reaching out through creation, through the prophets, through Jesus himself coming into the world. God is always reaching out. Is a church uh, overlooks, and one of the things I didn't expect is when I took the picture and I looked at it later, uh, the monk is setting up communion uh, as now the, uh, the view shed is uh, one of the holiest Muslim sites, uh, the temple, uh, the Dome of the Rock. Uh, and you see all of the places people go to connect with God uh, and, and the places that people have fought over over the years. Uh, and really the place where God is most present is when we're in communion with one another, when we're in peace with one another. What God wants more than anything is for us to reflect the love that Jesus talks about between him and the Father and the Spirit, and that we might be incorporated in that relationship. One of the things that moved me this week is that we have a parishioner uh, who's relatively new to the congregation who, who came up and uh, was a little anxious about settling in uh, and has made such abiding friendships in this congregation that uh, a half dozen people uh, informed me that she was going in for surgery. Uh, and she talked about the number of people in all of the groups that she's involved with at church that have reached out to her uh, and that uh, her uh, children wanted her to go to their place to convalesce. And she says, I've got my family here. I've got my parish family here. I've got my support system here. And in short time, we have become the holiest church uh, that you could possibly muster because we are in relationship, because we're reaching out which is what the body of Christ is supposed to do, which is what God in Trinity reflects. And we reflect hope to a broken world, to a place uh, where there is no peace at times, where there's estrangement. We reflect that third quality, that beautiful peace of the Trinity that God will never let us go. And the more boldly we receive that sacrament and walk through those doors and share that story that we've been telling since Advent uh, with the world, the more that we spend the next half of the year responding to that story, the more that we carry that hope that we get from the fact that God, who made us, never let us go, sent God to pour out God's love for us and promised, even as he ascends to heaven, that God will never, never put us down, will never, ever be apart from us, will never, ever stop trying to move into our lives. When we spend the rest of the year responding to that story, raising those newly baptized in those three core truths, the kingdom of heaven will come down. 
we'll know that kind of peace that Jesus prays for uh, there. We'll know that God is in the midst of us, and we'll understand more fully the relentlessness and the fullness of God's love the more we reflect it amongst one another. Amen.